Hello there, you're watching the press preview, a first look at what is on the front pages. Time then to see what is making the headlines with the editor of the Sheffield Star, Nancy Fielder, and the conservative commentator, Tim Montgomery. Very good to see uh, both of you. As ever, though, we turn our attention to the front pages. Let's start with the Financial Times, which leads on Joe Biden marking the anniversary of the storming of the Capitol building, saying the president fears for the state of American democracy. Prisoner cell Jock H is the headline for tomorrow's Metro, referring to the tennis player caught up in immigration detention on the Australian border. The Guardian has an exclusive on Conservative peer Michelle Moan and allegations which she denies surrounding contracts for PPE. Higher taxes for one million people earning more than £50,000 a year. That's the top story for The Telegraph. Rising fuel bills and prices to hit over 65s, the hardest, the squeeze splashed on the front page of The Express. The Daily Mirror reports that Prince Andrew has allegedly had to sell his £17 million skiing retreat as he prepares to pay legal bills. Fears over space travellers' eyesight should have gone to Spocksavers. That's the front of the Daily Star, which has to be said is on a bit of a roll. <laughs> Uh, so let's get the thoughts then of Nancy Fielder and Tim Montgomery. The first time I can remember for a while where every single paper has a different headline uh, that they've chosen. Um, so, Tim, what was your choice? You picked up on uh, the comments of Joe Biden one year on from the Capitol riots. Yes, it's, um, of course, a year ago when those momentous events really shocked uh, all of us. And obviously five people did die but it could have been so much worse. We could have seen some of the leading politicians in America killed uh, as well. And so I think it's absolutely right that we regard this uh, occasion uh, with uh, gravity and hope that finally um, we will see some coming together of the American political system. But I'm afraid what we're seeing is heightened rhetoric, not just from the Republicans, but from the Democrats as well. And people trying to use this occasion now as an opportunity to sort of advance their own politics rather than um, to try and heal and bring a very divided country back together. Well, a prayer vigil underway on the Capitol steps today with the uh, the speaker, um, uh, you know, uh, speaking right now. But this is the uh, the earlier pictures of, of th those members of Congress who are walking down those steps, uh, candles in hand, to mark that moment, which was really, Nancy, seen by many as an assault on democracy in America and remains the case that they, they feel, you know, in some respects, the reflections of it are still damaging. Yes, I mean, it was intended as an assault on democracy. That's absolutely what they wanted to do, and that is what they achieved. And as Tim said, this could have been so much worse. They took over, didn't they? As millions of people across the world watched absolutely staggered that America looked like it had completely lost control and tempor temporarily in the heart of the political centre, control had been lost. So it's absolutely right that they come together, that they remember and actually that work is done so that this can't be allowed to happen again. And there's a lot of talk around our people playing politics here, but this is politics. The whole debate was around that. And it was about an election that was lost or stolen, as we all remember all too well. So to say people playing politics today, well, we need to remember, but actually there is a lot of a debate still going on across America. And it seems almost as divided now as it was then. Yes, and another turbulent year ahead as well, Tim. The Senate, the House, the midterms. It's looking fragile for, for Joe Biden and the Democrats too, with many choices being made by Republicans still with the background of Mr, Mr. Trump. It's, I mean, it's, it's still an extraordinary picture in the States in terms of politics there. Yes, um, anyone who writes uh, Donald Trump off uh, should uh, be very cautious, I think. I think a year ago, many of us thought that his support for the kind of activity uh, that led to um, what we saw in Capitol Hill would finally be the end of his political career. But most opinion polls suggest that he's still the leading candidate for Republican voters. And the danger, I think, is that uh, Joe Biden, who came to the um, White House promising to unify America, is now a very unpopular president ahead of those midterms that you mentioned. And so what he's now trying to do is just get his core vote 
uh, to turn out. And that is done, he thinks, by being increasingly negative about Trump and the Republicans, um, firing up core Democratic voters. But in terms of a healing of America's sad political situation, we're not going to get it from uh, Joe Biden, just as we didn't get it from Donald Trump. Nancy, let's move on, shall we, to the Metro. Rather a clever um, headline for them, prisoner at cell jock H, although some people who are not as old as I am won't remember the TV show that it's referring to. But, I mean, this is, this is not going away. Protests in Melbourne, protests in Belgrade, in extraordinary words from the Serbian Prime Minister, not to mention Djokovic's parents, he's stuck there. You know, what happens now? Uh, this is my favourite front page of a long time. I didn't realise it made me old, but maybe it does. But, I mean, what a fantastic play on words that is. And actually, if you're not a massive tennis fan and if you're not a massive fan of Djokovic, maybe this is something that actually is a little bit laughable. So if you look at where the world is, how this pandemic, how this pandemic is going and impacting and destroying so many lives, and here we have international front pages looking at a millionaire, an incredibly good sportsman, but a millionaire who has chosen not to do what he needed to do to play, to, to defend, to get that 10th title, to get more adoration and more money. So, I mean, there is a bit of a laughter in this, I think. But, yeah, there is absolute outrage in, in his home country. There are fans outside the hotel where they think he is. And apparently the awful conditions are just too terrible to bear. But as we know, there are lots of people who've had to travel to Australia to say farewell to people who are dying, who've gone in far worse circumstances. And I have to say, well, I'm not a great tennis fan, but my sympathy here is rock bottom. Who was, I mean, the, let's talk about the care workers who've lost their jobs because they couldn't work because they weren't vaccinated, who were on the red line anyway. And here we are worrying about this millionaire. Maybe, maybe I've got it wrong. Maybe I just don't enjoy tennis enough. When well, that, that's it. It's it's a talking point, certainly, isn't it? The Metro does point out that he's refused to say if he's been jabbed, uh, but the fact that officials ruled his plea for medical exemption was insufficient. One presumes he has not been. Uh, it has to it has to be said. But um, Australia has some of the strictest conditions in the world, or has done over the last nearly two years. Tim, uh, is it right though that being vaccinated or unvaccinated should be so divisive? Oh, goodness knows. But I think it's a little bit related to our last story, in, in a way. We seem to be incapable, whether it's senior politicians or pundits, to be able to react to any story in a sort of a moderate way. You know, we have the Serbian political leadership accusing Australia of uh, favouring other tennis players because their guy isn't being allowed into Australia. Australia, of course, has an election coming up. So is the Australian government playing a tough approach to immigration to win the election? No one seems to be able to deal with anything in a calm way at the moment. The divisions that we see in America seem to be seeping into political discourse generally. I think a lot of it is to do with social media. I think partly, if I dare say, it's the 24-7 news cycle that we have. But just the lack of any sort of generosity of spirit towards uh, each other, a lack of grown-up political debate is, is despairing, really. Yeah, um, to be fair, it's uh, is Plan B enough or not is part of this debate. Is it, it you know, it all it all rolls in, isn't it? This sort of uh, diverse yeah. opinion we hear. Um, but the Metro picking up uh, in relation to the Djokovic story and not um, this mumbo jumbo idea about anti-vax nonsense that Boris Johnson spelt out today. If 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 you put all your policy is about vaccination, you really do need to get as many people vaccinated and boosted as possible, Nancy. Yeah, you do. And you do need these big sports stars and these celebrities and the people who different generations hold in high esteem to be on board with that. I mean, they are incredibly powerful. It doesn't matter whether you like that or not. That is the truth. And actually, yes, the politicians right across the world, if the message is vaccination, and it should be, and it is because that is the way to save lives and that is the way to make sure the health services aren't so overwhelmed they can't cope, then they need everybody on board. So, yeah, today um, the Prime Minister said it was all mumbo-jumbo. I mean, I'm biting my tongue as to the amount of mumbo-jumbo phrases that we've had from him himself, but actually on this one I do agree there is so much utter rubbish that is being spread around um, that we know not to be true about vaccines and it's scaring people and it is stopping people from taking a vaccine that could save their life. Uh, but the I think that works both ways, if I could just briefly. Look, I, I support vaccination. Um, vaccines are an essential way of keeping everyone safe. 
But people who support vaccines need to be careful about what they say as well. I think there's been exaggeration, for example, that if you are vaccinated, then you know you don't transmit. We now learn that's absolutely not the case. And actually, by overselling the case for vaccines, we actually encourage those people who don't want vaccines to think that actually there is something that they're genuinely uh, being hidden from them. So. Uh, we all need to be responsible in how we talk about uh, vaccines, not just uh, those who disagree with us. Yes, the medical advisers do clarify that, don't they? That if you have been vaccinated, you are less likely to get it and therefore less likely to transmit. And Boris Johnson today is suggesting that uh, when you look at what's happening to patients coming into hospital, a large number of them, perhaps 30 to 40 per cent of them, haven't actually been vaccinated at all. And that's increasingly true of people who go into ICU. And given such large proportions of the nation has been vaccinated, then clearly that is disproportionate. Uh, but the question I was going to ask you, Tim, in fact, was we're at the point now, can hospitals cope? And, you know, clearly the move is now towards the northwest in terms of the epicentre of this epidemic um, and whether the cases there are still rising, which is what the figures seem to show. So, you know, lo lots of data still to emerge in the coming days. Yeah, I think we seem to be getting to the position where... The risk to the NHS isn't from a large number of patients. Um, Omicom has affected many people, but not in the serious way that uh, Delta uh, did. But we have got a large number of NHS staff already exhausted after a very punishing couple of years having to self-isolate. So I welcome very much the government's efforts to, and measures to reduce the period that you have to self-isolate. Most people don't really have any serious infection when they're getting this virus. And I think we need our economy, we need our public services operating. So I think the balance that the government is striking is about right at the moment. But yes, the NHS um, does look like it's going to be OK, but yeah, we need to be vigilant. Um, I was going to squeeze in. Can I just, so go on, OK, go on. Very, very quickly. Just, can I just say, so a friend of mine's mum fell over on Tuesday morning in the northeast, broke her hip, waited for 12 hours at home in agony for an ambulance and then waited for 36 hours on a trolley in a hospital. She still hasn't had that operation. Even if you put COVID to one side and how many people have it, the NHS is not coping. It's absolute nonsense. It's on its knees as it is every winter and the pandemic is making it worse. Well, welcome back. You're watching the press preview. With me now, the editor of the Sheffield Star, Nancy Fielder, and the Conservative commentator, Tim Montgomery. Welcome back, both of you. So, let's go to the Daily Telegraph, Nancy. Uh, the Prime Minister in his wallpaper for access row over a donor's plan for a great exhibition. Do explain. Absolutely. So these are the texts that our Prime Minister, who you might have thought might be on top of where the money comes from, at least somebody in his team might be, um, forgot about these WhatsApp messages, forgot to reveal them in the big scandal that's been going on for months now about who paid for the flat, that in the end he paid for it to be refurbished, but it had already been funded by somebody else who happens to give lots of money to the Conservative Party. And these WhatsApp messages also discussed a great exhibition, which never actually happened, I believe, but it's a great example of kind of, this was not a, can I just borrow some money? It's not connected to anything. It, this is an example of kind of, do you want to do this? And don't forget, I won't forget about this. It's sort of rubbing each other's back, it seems to me. And the prime minister insists he's done nothing wrong. But frankly, I think most people see it for what it is. And it's interesting because I don't think this really cut through until the wine and cheese and everybody else is in lockdown and we're having non-parties in Downing Street. But I think because that one has such an impact on voters, I think the more and more of these things that we get, and I have no doubt there will be more similar scandals coming through, I think it just kind of adds to the pile. And I'd, I'd, I'd be amazed if we have the same Prime Minister when the next election comes around. Yes, I mean, uh, Tim, this was all right when Boris was Teflon politician. Um, he clearly is not now. And quite frankly, you know, you're doing up flat, a flat in an unstable job, with, which, is a, which is a short let, effectively. So what, what was the point of all this expenditure, apart from, apart from this idea that you're not supposed to know where the money comes from in case you have favour? And here it looks like in these messages, favour is being looked into. Well, look, to, to be fair, there is, there is a, I think, a £30,000 allowance for every new prime minister. Uh, you know, 
different prime ministers have different family arrangements. They, they, they have to live above the shop in Downing Street. And so I can understand why some work might have needed to be done. But yes, some, it seemed to be much more ambitious uh, than perhaps was necessary. Uh, the prime minister probably thought he had got away with it, as you sort of suggested. But I think where the British people are, they will forgive one or two transgressions. They know we all make mistakes in, in life. But the problem the Prime Minister has now is that there have been far too many of these uh, lapses. I think uh, because of his chaotic personal management rather than any sort of fundamentally unethical behaviour. But he really can't afford further missteps like this, or I'm afraid his reputation uh, for uh, probity will, will, will really be lost. And I think Conservative MPs will be watching him very carefully Tim? and saying this must be the last occasion or near the last occasion when you mess up like this, Prime Minister.